And let's begin once again with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Eternal God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us, that in difficult moments we might not despair nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. Mary, Mother of Mercy. St. Joseph. St. Faustina. St. Athanasius. All you holy angels and saints. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the instruction of our God. Wash yourselves clean. Put away our misdeeds from before my eyes. Cease doing evil. Learn to do good. Make justice your aim. Redress the wronged. Hear the orphan's plea. Defend the widow. Come now, let us set things right, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they may become white as snow. Though they be crimson red, they may become white as wool, if you are willing and obey. The word of the Lord. Please stand. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, Be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you shall be pardoned. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will they pour into the fold of your garment. For the measure you measure with, will be measured back to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Lord. Lord. On the night of February the 22nd, 1931, in a convent near the village of Plot, Poland, our Lord appeared in a vision to a simple, humble woman, an obscure nun, Sister Mary Faustina Kowalska. And in this historic vision, St. Faustina saw the Lord Jesus Christ dressed in white garment, with one hand raised in blessing, and the other hand touching the garment near the heart. And from his sacred heart there came beaming those two large rays of light, one red and the other white, symbolic of the price of our salvation, the blood and water that flowed from the divine heart pierced by the soldier's lance on the cross, the fountain of sacramental life in the church. To St. Faustina, Jesus said, paint an image according to the pattern that you see with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. I desire that this image be venerated first in your chapel then throughout the world. I promise that the soul that will venerate this image will not perish. And our Lord made St. Faustina the modern apostle of divine mercy. And his message to her is his message to all of us and to the whole world. And yet even now I find uh, that there are so many practicing Catholics who still don't know it, never heard it before. They know little or nothing about the divine mercy devotion, Little or nothing about our Lord's revelations to St. Faustina, nothing about what is in her diary. They know little about uh, the Feast of Divine Mercy and the second Sunday of Easter and all the indulgences attached to that. They don't know the chaplain of the Divine Mercy, all the promises attached to that. 
And because of the tremendous importance of this, I want to share this with you again this evening. And because our Lord's own words are so infinitely more important than anything that I can say to you, I want to summarize them again for you here tonight as we close our mission. To St. Faustina, Jesus said this, My daughter, tell the whole world about my infinite mercy. Let no soul appear to draw near to me, even though its sins be as scarlet. My mercy is so great that no mind, be it of man or of angel, will be able to fathom it throughout all eternity. Write down at once what you hear. You will prepare the world for my final coming. I am sending you with my mercy to the people of the whole world. I do not want to punish suffering mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. I use punishment when they themselves force me to do so. My hand is reluctant to take hold of the sword of justice. Before the day of justice, I am sending the day of mercy. Write this. Before I come as the just judge, I am coming first as the king of mercy. My heart overflows with great mercy for souls and especially for poor sinners. If only they could understand that it is for them the blood and water flowed from my heart as from a fount overflowing with mercy. For them I dwell in the tabernacle as the king of mercy. I desire to bestow my graces upon souls, but they do not want to accept them. You at least come to me as often as possible and take these graces they do not want to accept. In this way, you'll console my heart. Oh, how indifferent are souls to so much goodness, to so many proofs of love. My heart drinks only of the ingratitude and forgetfulness of souls living in the world. They have time for everything, but they have no time to come to me for graces. Souls who spread the honor of my mercy I shield through their entire lives and at the hour of death. I will not be a judge for them, but the merciful Savior. At that last hour, a soul has nothing to defend itself except my mercy. Happy is the soul that during its lifetime immersed itself in the fountain of mercy because justice will have no hold upon it. Tell sinners that no one shall escape my hand. If they run away from my merciful heart, they will fall into my just hands. End quote. Now, let me make this point. It's important to understand that God's message of mercy to the world did not start with our Lord's revelations to St. Faustina in the 1930s. It did not begin with the Sacred Heart devotions in the 17th century. In fact, there's nothing new about God's proclamation of his mercy. It's all over the sacred scriptures. You know, some of these crazy, whacked-out, modernist scripture scholars drive me nuts. They're commentaries on the Bible. They try to tell us that the Bible essentially presents us with two different gods. They say there's the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. The God of the Old Testament, they say, is the God of anger, wrath, judgment, vengeance, punishment, and the God of the New Testament, fully revealed in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, is the God of love and mercy and compassion. Well, this is a bunch of nonsense. Because God does not change. God doesn't change. People change. God doesn't change. We change. The Apostle St. James wrote, In God uh, there is no alteration nor any shadow of change. God said to the prophet Malachi, Surely I, the Lord your God, do not change. You see, the Bible presents us with different pictures of God at different points in salvation history, but never a contradictory or inconsistent one. The sacred scriptures speak in a very definite way about the mercy of God. The Bible clearly shows us a God who is merciful. 
both merciful and just in both the Old Testament and the New. For example, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, God was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten just men. They couldn't find ten just men. God spared the people of Nineveh when they repented of the preaching of the prophet Jonah, as awful as their crimes were. Nineveh was the great city of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were the Nazis of the Old Testament, the great persecutors of the Jewish people. They were cold-blooded killers. They were mass murderers. God forgave them. They repented. In the Old Testament, when God told the Israelites it would be an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, contrary to popular belief, he was not giving them a law of revenge. He was actually giving them a law of mercy. Even that was an expression of God's mercy. Why? Because an eye for an eye was a law that limited retribution. That is to say, there's only so far they could go to get back at an enemy. Someone who offended them. In those brutal ancient times, if you stepped on a man's toes, he might kill you for it. If you insulted or offended a member of his family, he might wipe out yours in a blood feud. In those days, when they went to war, often they killed or enslaved everyone. Men, women, children alike. In those days, reprisals, punishments, were totally disproportionate to the kind of offenses that were committed. An eye for an eye meant limited retribution for a hard-hearted people who did not understand the love of God and neighbor. Also in the Old Testament, think of the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. God says, wash yourselves clean, Cease doing evil, learn to do good. Come now, let us set things right, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they may become white as snow. Though they be crimson red, they may become white as wool, if you're willing and obey. In the New Testament, God, of course, is the merciful father of the gospel who forgave the prodigal son and welcomed him home with open arms and then said to the angry brother, celebrate and rejoice with me. Your brother was dead. Now he's alive again, was lost, and is found. The merciful father, the prodigal son, said, This brother of yours was dead. Why did he say that? Prodigal son wasn't dead. He wasn't physically dead. He was spiritually dead, dead in mortal sin. And you see, that is the reality of mortal sin. It kills the life of grace in the soul. Our Lord said to St. Faustina, my daughter, know this once and for all. There is only one thing that can separate the soul from me, and that is mortal sin, that alone, my Lord said. Sad to say, there are many Catholic parishes around this country where our people have not even heard the term mortal sin in 40 years. The Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to save us and redeem us from his sin, but he also came to show us what God is really like. And the most beautiful revelation of God the Father is given to us in the parable of the prodigal son. If you really want to know what God the Father is like, all you have to do is read Luke chapter 15. There is the love of God. There is the mercy of God revealed in the Father who waits with open arms. Hmm? Also, in the New Testament, think of the Apostle St. Paul. In his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, St. Paul said this, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our sins, brought us to life with Christ. By grace, you're being saved. The message of divine mercy resonates in sacred tradition, the lives of the saints and their writings. Let me share just a few of my favorite quotations from the saints here. Uh, this one is from St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, who you know I love. Uh, she said this, quote, 
if the greatest sinner on earth should repent at the moment of death and draw his last breath in an act of love, neither the many graces he had abused nor the many sins he had committed would stand in his way. Our Lord would receive him into his mercy. No one can make me frightened any more because I know what to believe about his mercy and his love. I know that in the twinkling of an eye, all those thousands of sins would be consumed as a drop of water cast into a blazing fire. End quote. In 1673, our Lord appeared in a vision to St. Margaret Mary a la Coque at paris le monial in France before the exposed Blessed Sacrament. Our Lord showed St. Margaret Mary a vision of his sacred heart and said this, Behold the heart that is loved so much and is loved so little in return. St. Margaret Mary's spiritual director was St. Claude de la Colombière, one of the greatest spiritual directors of all time. Now, I'd venture to say that most of us are concerned about the sins of the past, but our past sins, the sins we may have forgotten to confess, how God sees all that, whether or not those sins are really forgiven. If you're concerned about that, listen to these words of St. Claude. He said this, In thinking of what could trouble me at death, that is to say, my past sins and future punishment, this thought came to me and I have made it my own. It is a great consolation to me at death when my sins, known and unknown, trouble me, I will take them all and cast them at our Lord's feet to be consumed in the fire of his mercy. The greater they are, the worse they seem to me, the more willingly I'll give them to him because the offering will be all the more worthy of his mercy. And then St. Claude wrote this prayer. Lord, I will glorify you in showing how good you are toward sinners, that your mercy is above all malice, and that nothing can exhaust it, that no fall, however shameful and guilty it may be, should make the sinner despair of forgiveness. I have grievously offended you, O my loving Lord, but it would be far worse if I insulted you by despairing of my pardon." I will lose everything rather than the hope I have in your mercy. If I had fallen a hundred times and my sins were a hundred times worse than they are, I would still hope in you. End quote. So the point that I'm driving at is this. The saints clearly understood the mercy of God because they understood the theology of redemption. My brothers and sisters, we need the mercy of God. The spiritual life is, of its nature, we say, a constant, lifelong, daily struggle. Within every human soul, there is the battle that goes on, the battle between good and evil, light and darkness, virtue and vice. All of us feel the attractive power, the magnetic draw of sin, in our lives. Jesus said, the spirit is whittling and the flesh is weak. And in this battle, surrender is not an option. And you know what? In the spiritual battle of our lives, remember, the toughest opponent you will ever have to overcome is the one you see in the mirror every morning. Watch out for that guy. <laughs> Watch out for that gal. Hmm? Without the grace of God, without the divine assistance, believe me, that guy, that gal is more dangerous to you than the Russians and the Red Chinese and the North Koreans, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un, all the terrorists put together. St. Philip Neri used to make his morning offering 
and say, Lord, watch out for Philip. Beware of Philip today. He could betray you. <laughs> you see, the saints had what we call a healthy distrust of themselves. They understood human strength alone will never be sufficient to overcome sin and temptation. It is impossible to remain long in this state of grace without recourse to the means of grace, the power of prayer, spiritual reading and meditation, frequent worthy reception of the sacraments, most of all, avoiding the occasions of sin. Hmm? Remember this. Sin will not bring you peace. Don't kid yourself. Now, you can have a superficial external kind of peace. Uh, you can have a false sense of security. You can dull and deaden your conscience through habitual sin. But you will never have true, lasting peace. It will all catch up with you in the end as it always does. Hmm? Well, people try to deceive themselves. Right? You can try to find your fulfillment in sinful relationships and sinful lifestyles. Uh, you can adopt what we used to call the playboy mentality or the playgirl mentality. Right? You can adopt the rotten, insidious, contraceptive mentality. You can surrender your body, which God intends to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, to the pagan mores of the sexual revolution, the whole subculture of pornography, fornication, adultery, homosexual activity, sodomy, self-abuse, and degradation. You can have a kind of false, fleeting peace and pleasure as somebody like you Hefner had walking around in his bathrobe for 70 or 80 years. Hmm? <laughs> now, I know we have mostly an older crowd here, and I know that you would remember Hugh Hefner. Hmm? Hugh Hefner passed away about a year and a half ago. And in case you don't know, Hugh Hefner was the founder of Playboy magazine. He is called the godfather of modern pornography. Hugh Hefner was a celebrity, an icon, in the American pop culture for more than half a century. And today, I'd be willing to bet you most of the millennials and the Generation Z kids don't even know who he was. Hmm? But I was thinking about you, Hefner. And I asked myself, did any man ever lead so many other men into sin? Not to mention the women. Now, Hugh Hefner was a lifelong committed atheist right at the end. He never deviated from that in any way. He once said, It has always been perfectly clear to me that religion is a myth. So now he knows better. Hmm? <laughs> yes, uh, Hugh Hefner would always tell men that uh, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there's no afterlife. There is no re eternal reward. There is no eternal punishment. So live for today. Get all the pleasure you can any way that you can. Hmm? He boasted that in his lifetime, he had had sex with more than a thousand different women. Yet among them all, he said, he could never find his soulmate. Poor you. Is it any wonder he could never find his soulmate? He could never see past a woman's body long enough to know she even had a soul. We have a name for that. We call it lust. How many men fantasized about living the life of somebody like you, Hefner? The riches, the fame, the mansions, the sex, the women. Where is he now? Where did it all get him? Where is that man spending eternity? We don't know. Nobody knows. I say, may God have mercy on his soul. But 
If I had to bet on it, I would say I would not want to be in his red silk bathrobe about now. Hmm? Hugh Hefner was a man who perverted and distorted the true meaning of love and human sexuality. We live with his awful legacy to this day. You know, within every human soul, there is a dark side. And that dark side, left to itself, unchecked by virtue and grace, will conquer. And when it does, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, the human person can be reduced to the level of an animal, sometimes even a monster. For example, surrender to lust, an impurity in thought and in action, so often leads to sexual addiction, obsession, and finally, perversion. And that is why pornography has now become, spiritually speaking, America's most deadly addiction. There are now an estimated 4.2 million pornographic websites on the internet. That number is going up by the day, by the hour, in fact. I call addiction to internet porn the methamphetamine of the soul. Poison. I have a priest friend who's a canon lawyer working in the diocesan marriage tribunal. And he came home from work at the end of a really rotten day, a particularly exasperating day, depressed. And over supper, he's telling us, his brother priests, he said, you would not believe how many marriages are being broken up by addiction to internet porn. But you know what? That should make sense to you. Because a man who gets hooked on porn, eventually will begin to lose interest in his own wife. It becomes a rotten, insidious form of adultery. It is poison. If it's in your life, God wants it out. My brothers and sisters, we live in a kind of society we find ourselves constantly bombarded with temptation, especially the temptations against purity. The whole environment we live in, contaminated, polluted, Television, the movies, the internet, pornography is everywhere, immodesty and dress. For that reason, it really takes a heroic effort. The key word here is heroic, especially in the part of the men. A heroic effort to be able to put that virtue of chastity into practice. Again, Jesus said, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. We must have recourse to all the means of grace. You cooperate with the grace of God by the power, the grace of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to rise above those temptations in your life. But it is truly a daily struggle, a daily battle. All of us have got to be willing to fight it to the end. Remember our Lord said, those who persevere to the end will be saved. Hmm? And then there is greed, avarice. Greed always leaves the soul wanting more, more, more. The greedy person is never satisfied. Enough is never enough. Because material goods can never satisfy the deepest longings of the human spirit. Think of the alcoholic. The alcoholic is never satiated. He's got to battle the addiction. There's the old saying for the alcoholic, one drink is too many, a thousand are not enough. The drug abuser gets hooked, and the high always wears off, and there's got to be more and more bigger doses, more potent junk to get the same kind of high. The end is addiction, destruction of the person in mind and body, and very often the ruin of the people who are closest to him, the people that he loves. Jesus said, those who live in sin become the slaves of sin. This is the bondage of the human will. The surrender of the soul device. 
Now, many people try to deceive themselves by claiming that they are following their own consciences when what they are really following are their own sinful desires and their own lustful passions. Keep in mind, this is an important point. All of us have a serious moral obligation, a grave obligation to have rightly formed consciences, correct consciences, consciences formed and informed in accordance with God's definitive revelation to humanity. God's eternal moral law expressed clearly, consistently by the church for 2,000 years. Hmm? St. Peter wrote, live as free men, but don't use your freedom as a cover for vice. So we can say there are two kinds of peace. Hmm? There is the false peace people make for themselves through surrender to vice, compromise who are the world and the flesh and the devil, and the true lasting peace that is the gift of God. Hmm? Here's the key point. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. Let me say that again for you. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. God loves you and God's love will never fail you. God made you and God did not bring you into this world to abandon you. And if you think that he would, it can only be because you don't know him. If you've got it, God forbid, get over the idea that your sins are bigger than the mercy of God who sent his only begotten son to die for you. Early on in my years in apostolic ministry, I was very blessed to know Mother Angelica. And uh, I have always believed, and there's no doubt in my mind, that Mother Angelica is a saint. Hmm? But I remember Mother telling us one time, she said, you know, if you were the only sinner in the world, if you were the only soul in this world in need of redemption, God still would have become man. Jesus Christ would have come into this world to die for you, you alone. That is the infinite value of a single soul in the sight of Almighty God. God offers the gift of his mercy. We have got to cooperate with that grace. Now, whenever we talk about the divine mercy, I think we have also got to talk about two really, really bad responses to it. The worst responses to the divine mercy. Two extremes, right? Two opposite extremes, sins against the virtue of hope. The first, the most rampant today, is presumption. Presumption, the idea that God is so loving and God is so merciful that it doesn't matter what I do. It is the idea that God understands me and God wants me to be happy, so therefore God is going to let me do all the things that I think are going to make me happy. I can commit as many sins as I want to. I don't have to repent. I don't have to change my ways. I'm going to heaven anyway. There it is. The big lie. Right out of the mouth of the devil. The deadly trap. One time, a man, a very proud man, went to Padre Pio, and he told Padre Pio he wasn't going to confession anymore because he didn't believe in hell anymore. And Padre Pio looked at him he glared at him with those piercing eyes that he had. He said to him, you'll believe it when you get there. <laughs> now, the other extreme, the other sin against the virtue of hope is despair. Giving up on the mercy of God. The idea that my sins are too big and too bad and too many for God to forgive. It is that 
seductive little voice that tries to get into your head telling you God doesn't really love you. God is not going to forgive you. There's no turning back now for you. You've gone too far. Don't you know? God has abandoned you. That's why things are going wrong in your life. Why don't you just give it up? It's no use. It's too late for you. There is no hope for you, no hope for you, no hope for you. There it is. The devil trying to drag us down into despair. I've heard despair called the capital city of hell. Listen to the words of Archbishop Fulton Sheen from his book entitled Peace of Soul. He wrote this. The figure upon the cross is not a KGB agent or a Gestapo inquisitor, but a divine physician. We only ask we bring our wounds to him in order that he may heal them. Was it not he who told us? I say to you, there shall be more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than over ninety-nine just. Why is there more joy in heaven for the repentant sinner than for the righteous? Because God's attitude is not judgment, but love. God's attitude is not judgment, but love. Hmm? Now, I have known um, many Christians who have the idea that God is out there, kind of like the divine traffic cop, waiting to catch you in the act. God is out there, kind of like the divine state trooper, hiding on the other side of the hill, his little radar gun, waiting to catch you, breaking the laws. So we can pounce on you and say, gotcha! Now you're in mortal sin. Now you're going to hell. No, that's not God's will for you. That's not God's will for anybody, right? Now, make no mistake, <laughs> we have to say this. Hmm? Nothing has changed. If you die unrepentant, if you die in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. Hell is real. Hell is forever. You got to take God at his word. Remember, no figure of the Bible spoke as much or as often about the reality of hell and the possibility of eternal punishment than did our Lord Jesus Christ. So, don't mess with God. Hmm? Don't play fast and loose with the salvation of your soul. You could lose it. But again, that's not God's will for anybody. God is always that loving, merciful Father of the gospel who waits with open arms for us to come home. Hmm? The mercy of God is often called God's greatest attribute. The mercy of God, we say, is deserved by none but available to all, one for us by the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what is the most powerful channel of God's mercy? It is, of course, the sacrament of penance, confession. Confession spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, positively, the best source of peace there is in the whole world. Say what you will. Confession. The ordinary means for the forgiveness of mortal sins committed after baptism. Confession. The way that God established for us to do penance and to make reparation for sin. For those who say, I'm not going to confession. I don't have to confess my sins to a priest. I'm going to confess my sins directly to God. Uh, we say, remember that faith, true faith, is never a matter of doing your own thing. True faith is a matter of doing God's thing. Worshiping God in the way that God wants to be worshipped. God's thing is confession for the forgiveness of sins. Does anybody really think God needs to be told what our sins are? God knows perfectly well what they are. God knows everything. He knows our sins better than we do. Now God is calling on us to do penance, make reparation for sin. Right? The divinely established means is the sacrament of penance, the ordinary means. Jesus Christ gave us 
the sacrament of his mercy on that first Easter Sunday evening when he appeared to the apostles in the upper room after his resurrection. And we read about this in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. Now, no doubt, uh, you've heard these verses many times before, but here I'll ask you to listen again carefully to try to draw out the deeper meaning. Listen specifically here for the word peace. The words of St. John. On the evening of that first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Now to our fundamentalist friends, I say, please don't tell me, don't try to tell me, our Lord's words in this gospel have no meaning. Again, our Lord never said anything he did not mean. The gospel shows us clearly that our Lord gave his apostles the power to forgive sins in his name. Think about this. Our Lord's very words in the gospel presuppose confession. Our Lord gave his disciples the power to forgive sins. He did not give them the power to read minds. How could they know which sins to forgive and which to retain if nobody would confess? For me, this has always been like a theological no-brainer, right? A matter of spiritual common sense. Right? But the beautiful thing about confession is this. Listen, whenever you confess your sins to the best of your ability and the best of your memory, and you haven't held anything back, haven't held back any mortal sins deliberately, and you are truly sorry for all of your sins, and you've got that firm purpose of amendment, which simply means you're going to try with the help of God's grace to avoid the same sins in the future, you always leave that confession with that confident assurance of God's complete forgiveness. And that's something that will fill you with a sense of inner peace. It is so often a burden lifted off of our shoulders. It gives us a certain sense of relief. And often the joy, the joy that comes with having a clear conscience before God. Right? Remember, when you have made a sincere confession, a valid confession, all your sins are forgiven. Even the sins you may have forgotten to confess from years back are forgiven. Why is that? It is because God sees the disposition of the heart. Hmm? Remember, the human mind is not like a computer where you can enter in the right program and have all the data of your past sins print out in front of your eyes, right? You know, we live with the effects of original sin. One of those effects is that our intellects are darkened and our wills are weakened. We forget things all the time, right? God sees the disposition of the heart. God sees the contrition that is in the heart, right? What is true contrition? There are three elements to true contrition. Sorrow for sin, hatred for sin, and again, the firm purpose of amendment. Now remember, we should make frequent use of confession and we must often make a good examination of conscience so we don't forget our sins. There's a danger in that, right? But if there's some sin that returns to your mind, that comes back to your memory from the past, something you don't think you've confessed, just bring that up in your next confession. See how simple it is. The infinite mercy of God. 
Friends, what I'm saying is confession will make a new person out of you, a new man, a new woman out of you because that sacramental confession is a personal meeting, a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. The incomparable power of that 5, 10, 15 minute sacramental meeting with Christ can change hearts and lives forever. I have seen it so many times over the years. You know, in my years as a spiritual director and confessor, some of the most tortured souls that I've ever known have been women who have had abortions. Time goes on. They get older. Reality of what they've done sinks in because ordinarily, nature and conscience will not allow them to forget. And for many women, there can come a nightmare, a living hell, a pain and guilt that can go on for many years, sometimes even for a lifetime, without the experience of the divine mercy. Right? You know, a woman who is making that journey to repentance, the journey to the Father, and in fact, anyone, anyone making that sometimes painful but ultimately joyful journey to the Father in repentance can find there are two big challenges. Right? The first challenge is to be able to accept the forgiveness, the mercy that God wants to give to you. To truly believe that God really does love you more than you can ever imagine, that God is always there to forgive when you're willing to repent. But I think that the second challenge, the far bigger challenge often is to be able to forgive yourself. Remember, God wants you to experience his mercy and forgive yourself. You got to forgive yourself, right? You can't change the past, but it doesn't have to wreck your life. All of us, I know all of us, looking back at our past lives, wish there were things we could do over again, times we could live over again. We can't do it. God knows we cannot live on painful, bitter regrets and memories. We have to go on. Sometimes we have to have the mindset of the Apostle St. Paul looking back at his past life. He said, I give no thought to what's behind me, only to what lies ahead. You know, if you think that your sins are too big and too bad and too many for God to forgive, think of the Apostle St. Paul. Started out a young man, anything but a saint. He was the young Pharisee named Saul, persecutor of Christians. Saul, you remember, took part in the killing of St. Stephen. And St. Stephen, before he died, prayed to our Lord to forgive his persecutors, and our Lord answered the prayer of St. Stephen in a big way. Saul had a dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus where he was headed to persecute more Christians. He was blinded by a flash of light, knocked off of his horse, and he heard the voice of Jesus Christ saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice our Lord did not say, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting Christians? He said, why are you persecuting me? The church is his mystical body. We are his members by virtue of our baptism. But think about this. If St. Paul had for a moment doubted the love of God and the power of his mercy, he could never have gone on to do what he did. He could never have gone on to become one of the two greatest apostles and the greatest missionary in the history of the church. Uh, I once heard somebody say, you know, you priests, you priests made up all this stuff about confession because you want to hear all the dirt. Yeah, you want to hear all the scandal. You want to know how bad people are. Well, that's a lot of nonsense. And, and I'm sure that Father Portelli would agree with me when I say hearing confessions doesn't tell me how bad people are. Rather, on the contrary, it tends to tell me how good people are. I have heard so many beautiful, sincere, humble confessions 
that have caused me to stop and give thanks to God there on the spot, pray to God and say, Lord, give me the grace to make that kind of a humble confession. Give me that kind of humility. That strengthens my faith. That's edifying to me. Pope St. John Paul II said this in a homily. The apostle of the confession is surely the best source of peace and joy there is in the whole world. Those confessionals scattered about the world where men declare their sins don't speak of the severity of God, they speak of his mercy. And all those who approach the confessional, sometimes after many years weighed down with mortal sins, in the moment of getting rid of this terrible burden, find at last a longed-for relief. They find joy and tranquility of conscience, which, outside confession, will never be able to find anywhere, end quote. So, friends, there you have it, the divine mercy. Hmm? And I will leave you with our Lord's words to St. Faustina. Jesus says, My mercy is greater than your sins and those of the entire world. Who can measure the extent of my goodness? For you I descended from heaven to earth. For you I allowed myself to be nailed to the cross. For you, I let my sacred heart be pierced with a lance, thus opening wide the source of my mercy for you. Come then with trust to draw graces from this fountain. I never reject a contrite heart. Hand over to me all your troubles and griefs, and I shall heap upon you all the treasures of my grace. Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I just want to take a moment and tell you how much I have enjoyed being here at St. Athanasius to preach this mission. And again, I thank Father Portelli uh, for inviting me to come and spend this time with you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dick and Beth Kinderman for uh, letting me stay in their nice little uh, guest house. Uh, certainly, they have been most gracious hosts this week, and it's been a very pleasant stay for me here. I thank uh, Sandy, who uh, watched over my CD sets at my table and took care of everything for me this week. And I thank all of you for your hospitality and for your generosity. And uh, I thank God. I thank God for the good turnout that we had and uh, for the good confessions that we had and the good weather that he allowed us to have during this, this week. And I hope it's been a great experience for you as well. And uh, again, uh, there is much to be thankful for. Uh, now, uh, it will be last call tonight on the uh, CD sets and the, uh, the, the books. Uh, you know, the problem with a mission like this is that the people that most need to hear the message are the people who don't come. So it is the people like you who have to get the message out to them somehow for the sake of evangelization. That's why we make the CD sets, right? Um, I have a few that might interest you um, since this is the last call. This is a series entitled Confidence in God. There's a talk I wish I had time to give this week um, called Confidence in God on the Mysterious Workings of Divine Providence in Your Life. And in it, I take up the eternal question, why bad things happen to good people, right? How important it is to trust in God. Also, uh, uh, I have a series here that I did with Father Wade Menezes, recorded by E.W. Etienne. It's the audio version of a Lenten mission we did for them. It's called Thirst for Truth and Battle for Souls, and there's about... Ten hours of listening on these, and uh, you know they make um, they make uh, uh, great little resource materials for evangelization. And uh, if you're making a day of recollection or a private retreat or for a prayer group, or if you just need to kill some time when you're driving, the CDs are great. So check those out. Also, I have a single here. I think we still have uh, several copies of this left. But uh, the title of this single is "Scandals in the Church." and ruin of souls, right? And in this talk, I will tell you exactly 
what the nature of the crisis we are facing in the church right now is, exactly what the cause of it is, exactly what needs to be done about it, and I'll pull no punches and mince no words, right? So check that out if you're interested. And uh, now um, we're going to have exposition again, and I'll begin hearing confessions. I want to do something I haven't had the chance to do since the mission began. Um, I'm going to come out and greet you as you leave, but after I've done that, I will come back inside and begin hearing confessions for those of you who would like to take this final opportunity to receive the sacrament of penance during the mission. God bless you all.